If you got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 15. It's hard to believe that we're only on chapter 15. You know, we've been 19 weeks now, 19 weeks in Acts. I never thought it would take this long, and uh, I hope you're enjoying it. it the, the rough part is, is, is we missed that, that first Wednesday, but I love that first Wednesday at the same time, that communion and prayer. We'll never, we'll never miss that, but sometimes it, we skip a week, so we have to kind of catch back up, and uh, it really makes it feel long. We'd probably be in Acts for a year, I bet, half a year at least. That's something, isn't it? Well, probably pushing a year, I bet, time you add in all the the first Wednesdays of the month. So um, I usually spend some time reviewing last week's lesson. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. There's just a few things I want to go over from last week's lesson, um, chapter 14. Paul is in, in chapter 14. He's now on fire. He's preaching. I don't know if you remember that um, earlier on in Acts. Every time he'd preach, he got shut down, and, and, and they'd send him away. And he's, he's 10 years in the wilderness, it seems like. And then now all of a sudden, he, doors are opening for him to preach. But uh, doors are also closing as well. He gets opportunities to preach. It's accepted. It takes on uh, fire. And then all of a sudden, persecution hits. And, you know, all of it's the Lord's will. Whether you believe it or not, God that Romans eight twenty eight says all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who called according to his purpose. Paul was the one that wrote that. And if anybody could could say with without a shadow of a doubt that had the credentials to write that verse, it was Paul. Because I think he probably suffered the most greatly for the gospel outside of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. He really did. Because the first time he preached it was accepted in chapter 14, and then later on, they ran him out of town. And so he goes to the next town, and he preaches, and, and it's accepted, and he starts preaching again, and then all of a sudden, they drag him outside, and they stone him to death. You know, I, I really believe he died. I just do, because he said, uh, and then and they left him there for dead, and he gets back up, and he goes back into the town. Who does that? You know, think about that. Who does that? If, if, if you went to a town and you preached and they stone you and leave you for dead outside the city, who gets back up and goes back in? That's the kind of guy Paul was. There's something, isn't it? And then remember last week we read about the physical description of Paul. And uh, he was, yeah, I'll just read it again because you enjoyed it so much. A man approached, it's, this was a second century eyewitness that, that wrote this. It said, a man approaching small in size with meeting eyebrows, that's a unibrow, and with a rather large nose, ball-headed, bow-legged, strongly built, full of grace. For at times he looked like a man, and at times he had the face of an angel. And uh, so, you know, mom reminded me last week, too, that, that they lowered Paul down in a basket one time. So he probably was a small man. And uh, so, uh, yeah, Paul suffered greatly. I, it's hard to believe all the things that he went through. And then at the very end of um, chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had just finished their first missionary journey. They just got their first lap in from all the towns, and, and they came back to Antioch. Remember, Antioch was the, it's going to be the headquarters for missionary work. Jerusalem is like the mother church. But Antioch is like the, um, the outpost for missionaries. Most missionaries will come out of Antioch and go from there. And uh, when they come back, they had like a missionary conference. That would have been cool to be in, wouldn't it? Just to hear the, the stories and the testimonies. Because I believe we probably only have part of them. All the testimonies and all the things Paul had said and done and, and Barnabas. Both of them were great men of God. Both of them were. And so... We're going to move on to tonight's lesson, and, but before we start reading chapter 15, um, I want to say this, kind of set the platform for chapter 15. Just because people get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean there won't be conflict. 
and I'm so thankful that we have the book of Acts, aren't you? Because it records everything. Luke was a great historian, and he just records the facts. He's just recording the facts. And uh, one thing I've learned is ministry is messy. It is. And, uh, the six years I've pastored, I have learned that ministry is messy. And the bigger the ministry, the messier it gets. And so you just got to get used to it. The Bible says if there's no ox in the stall, there's no mess. So with ox comes strength, and with ox there comes work, and with ox there comes potential, but also with an ox there comes a great big mess. I know I've cleaned some stalls. I don't know about you. So, and not just ox stalls, but stalls in the church. I've cleaned some messes, tried to. And so this chapter that we're going into, chapter 15, is going to be filled with conflict. It's going to be, uh, many times we read the Bible and we, we, we get the highlights, Acts chapter 2. I love Acts chapter 2. It's great. It was the explosion of the church. It's where this church started. 3,000 were added. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. But Acts 15 is, is when real life hits. And you're, you're, you're full, of, yeah, full of the Holy Spirit. These people are full of the Holy Spirit. But now they got some, they got some ministries and, and messes going on because people are involved. Turn to somebody and say, you're messy. That's right. That's the way it is. And uh, it's one, and here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's one thing to see the world disagree, but it's another thing to see the church disagree. It's a whole other level when a, when a fellow spirit-filled believer disagrees with you. But I'm going to say this. Because here's, here's the power. The Word of God says this, if, if any two of you agree in my name, I'm telling you, there's power when we come into agreement. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in the upper room and they were all in one accord, and that's when the Holy Spirit fell. But we still have, there's still going to be disagreements. Um, I've, had, I've had many disagreements with good God-fearing people. I have. And I'm sure if you, if you walk long enough, as a Christian, you will have disagreements with God-fearing people. You will. I still love them, and I know they're still a child of God, but there's some places that we'll disagree. And it's okay, right? <laughs> um, I've just thought about that. You know, if you, if you come on Sundays, especially the second service, you look and you say, we need a bigger building. And so we're going to go through another building process eventually. I don't know how that's going to look or what that looks like. And I'll be quite frank, I'm tired, but we're going to have some disagreements. Not everybody's going to like everything that happens as far as how the building looks and what, what, what you know. And so, I, you know, I've heard, I've heard it all in church, trust me. As a worship leader, I was a worship leader before I was a pastor, Worship is the most controversial place that you can land as in the church. I think God prepped me for ministry, for disagreements. Because as a worship leader, you got people that come up to you and say, I want all the old songs. Won't you sing more old songs? I love the old songs. And I love the old songs. I do. We just sang Higher Ground. But then to have the, the young people come up and say, why don't you sing some of the young, new songs? I'm, I'm, I, we've that old stuff. It's old stuff. Let's sing some new stuff. And then they'll, they'll even use verses to back their claims. They'll, they'll pull out the verse where it says, sing a new song unto the Lord. And you're like, what in the world? You know what I mean? And, and, then, and, then, and then the sound guy back there, you know, he'll be, they'll be like, it's too loud. Or it's too quiet. Or we can't hear when the minister speaks. Or, and, and, and so I'm telling you, you'll have disagreements as the Lord prepped me for ministry through worship. And, and, and just, so you grow a real thick skin after a while, and you just kind of like, okay, mm -hmm, yeah, right, let's go on. And so, <laughs> and I want to say this also. When you go through a, a building process, and as a, a former, uh, uh, I was a fly-by-night carpenter, I guess you could say, and builder, Austin's much better than I am, and and I know a lot of you all have built things. There's 50 different ways to build the same building. 
You know that? There's 50, and, and not one of them's like, this is the perfect way. This is the way, set in stone, that it's got to be done. It's not, there's, no, there's not one there. there. I've seen people build a beautiful building this way, and I've seen them build it completely different, but they build a, a beautiful building another way. And so that's the way it is also in church. As complicated as the structure of a building is, so is a church is even more complicated and more complex a lot of times. But there's always a foundation. Amen? And you can always come back to the foundation. And, and, and uh, the foundation is this. It's Jesus Christ, him crucified, risen and coming again. And if we can agree on that, we can disagree on the minors. But we got to agree on the majors. Right? That's what makes us children of God. That's why, you know, uh, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for checking me. I'm getting better, see? Um, but I have known great men of God that disagree over the minor doctrines. But when it comes to the major doctrine, they, they agree. That's one of the reasons why you've got denominations in some areas. It's just the way it is. They disagree in some of the minors. So you agree with that? That's good. I was hoping we'd agree. Um, here's another thing. I, I, I know taking a little bit of time before we get into it. Um, one thing, I, another nugget that I've learned in ministry and still growing in is I'm learning to love people right where they're at. You've got to learn to do that. You don't have to accept their lifestyle. You don't, if, if, they're, if they're living a sinful life, you don't, you don't have to uh, uh, accept a sinful lifestyle, but you need to learn to love people where they're at. And it's, hard, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. We don't compromise the message, but Jesus is in charge of the change, not me. I've learned this. I can't change nobody, but Jesus can. Amen? And, and, and in order for me and you to walk together in church, we got to share that foundation. Jesus Christ, him crucified, risen and coming again. After that, if we can agree on that, we can disagree on the others. Amen? Okay, so Acts chapter 15, starting at verse 41, or for, for verse 1. You're going to see uh, right out of the gate, we're going to have... Uh, con we're going to have a conflict. So while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men came from Judea, arrived and began teach to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send pa Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and the elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and then they stopped along the way to Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to the jo everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were, were being converted. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, now I'll have to say that real quick, Phoenicia and Samaria were primarily Gentiles. They were, they, so they, they would receive this news pretty happily. They, weren't, they didn't have a huge Jewish population. If they did, it was mixed. And, so, and mixed was worse than being pure Jew. It was worse than being a Gentile. It was like you, had, you didn't belong to nobody. And so they received the joy greatly. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. And they reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to a sect of Pharisees stood up and insisted, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and the elders met together to resolve this issue. That's a conflict. It's a big conflict. You got to see this. And this is in the church. This is in the spirit-filled church of the first century. So you can't get much closer to Jesus than these guys were. And, but here's the conflict. Jewish men 
I, I, one thing I noticed is it, di- it didn't really call them converts. It said some, some Jewish men. Yeah, they came into the church and they started teaching, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. And they started putting conditions on salvation. And that would have been, you know, because he remember, if you remember Cornelius, when we talked about him a while back, he would have been part of these people because he was, it said he was a God-fearer. Remember that, a God-fearer? And what a God-fearer meant is he followed everything. He actually converted to Judaism. He believed in everything, but he was not cir- circumcised. He didn't follow through at the very end. And at that point, he couldn't enter into the temple of worship and, and the sacrifice area. He couldn't enter that part of, of the of the the ceremonies. And so they start putting these conditions on these people and saying, you've got to be circumcised. And what I've learned and when I study the Bible is man always adds more to what you've got to do to be saved. It does. Whether you like it or not, it, man always tries to make you work to God. And that's not how it is. Jesus came down to man. We don't have to work to God. He'll come to you. And, and there's no way we can work and be good enough to God. I saw this. Moses gave us, God gave Moses 10 commandments. Remember that? Those 10 commandments still stand for today. You still don't kill. You still don't uh, ch- cheat and lie and, or lie and, and commit adultery. You don't do those things, right? Well, Jesus even narrowed it down to two commandments. Remember that? When they asked him, he took the 10 and made two because they said, which is the greatest of the Ten Commandments? And he said, these two you shall follow. He said, first one is, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like that, love your neighbor as yourself. So he narrowed it down to two. God always makes it easier. Man always makes it harder. And so these, uh, the Pharisees, if you study it out, they took the Ten Commandments and they interpreted them and they made 613 regulations. Could you imagine trying to follow 613 regulations? It was like they would put a heavier and heavier load upon the people. That's exactly what Jesus said. He said that you don't do nothing to lighten their load. It's actually called the mitzvot. It's 613 rules, 248 positive do's. You got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And then there was 365 don't do's. Could you imagine? So you got to understand, these men that entered into the church and they saw the Gentiles and it's just a free gift to them. Well, their whole life they've been trying to follow 613 rules and so now it's too good to be true. They feel like you, did, you wasn't there in the beginning. You didn't get to see the whole picture. You didn't get to see that you didn't, you know, we had to work our way, but then we still accept the grace of Jesus. I can see that, can't you? Can you see what they're coming from in some, some areas? You take, here, here's another thing I wrote down that I thought was interesting. Just the Sabbath. Remember this, the Ten Commandments of Sabbath, keep the Sabbath holy? If you look up, they actually wrote 24 pages on how to keep the Sabbath. All the way down as if it was legal to carry a fig or not on the Sabbath. When you put man into the mix and they want to interpret it, they'll put as many rules and regulations as they can on somebody and try to work to God. And that's not how it is. Right? (laughs) So... They see, they see the Gentiles as just getting a uh, get-out-of-jail-free card, I think. And they said, well, they didn't do anything about it. So let's go on. Verse 7. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe God knows people's hearts. 
And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are, we are, we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? That's good news. That's the best news right there. Aren't you glad it's through grace? Faith through grace. You just got to you, you gotta just place everything. Remember that I said about that? It was a couple of sermons ago. I said where you recline on Jesus. You recline everything you have on Jesus. I'm not good enough. I can't be good enough. I recline on him. Amen? And I'm so thankful because <laughs> I'm, I'm so thankful it's grace because we'd have to rewrite the song Amazing Grace to a Amazing Circumcision, How Sweet the Sound. <laughs> Wouldn't that be terrible? <laughs> As all the men go, ooh, that's right. Amazing Circumcision, How Sweet the Sound. Not Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Yeah. Verse 12. Everyone listened as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. There's so many sermons and testimonies in the Word that I wish they would have recorded for us. I think about, remember the road to Emmaus when Jesus, um, he appeared to his disciples and he was walking with them and after he was crucified and and. That, that message is never recorded. But they said this. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us? Man, I wish, I wish we could hear some of those. I wish we would have wrote those messages down. But we don't have them. But this is one place I would love to hear too. I would love to hear all the, the miraculous things and signs and wonders that God did through Paul and Barnabas. Then verse 13. It said, when they had finished, James... That's Jesus' half-brother, because the other James got, got uh, beheaded. Um, James, half, Jesus' half-brother, stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the, the time God first visited the Gentiles to take, them, take from them a people for himself. And this conversation of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted as it is written. And he goes on, he's going to, James uh, stands up and he quotes, this is from the book of Prophet of Amos. It says, Afterward I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it. Mom talked about this this morning. Uh, this, this, he said that God's a restorer. Do you see that? God restores. I will rebuild in its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He has made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles. What did he say? We should not make it difficult. Somebody say, praise the Lord. You're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Gave them four things. Four things. You see this? Four things. The first one is abstain from food offered to idols. To me, I believe this. It, it's, uh, it speaks of having no other gods before me. Think about that. God said that. I don't have any other gods before me. And don't even dabble in things that are attached to other gods. If you want to apply that to today, 
um, because you don't see a whole lot of people offering sacrifices to other gods, right? But we do see people that are dabbling in witchcraft. We do see people that are, that are, are entertaining things that, that talk about other gods. And, and so that, that is something you need to, if you come Tuesday night, I've, I have a, a list of seven things that hinder people from getting healed. And one of them is being attached to things that are occult, to things that, that talk about other gods. Um, I've, I've had people get mad at me and, and because I've, I've said a ma- the Masons are an occult. They are. If you go into their degrees and you took into their vows, um, they, they make vows to other gods. And they call the, uh, they call the creator the, the, uh, the architect of the universe. And the higher up you get into their degrees, they don't talk about Jesus. There's no mention of Jesus. And so... Whether you make you mad or not, I'm sorry. I'll preach you the truth. Stay away from things that are that are that are and that call up other gods. I'll have no other god before me. And then the second thing was was sexual immorality. Um, we see that everywhere today. In blatant, blatant, in the pulpits, and and all over our country. And I'm not saying that to try to paint a dark picture because Jesus is greater. But, but we see these things. It, they really didn't make it hard for us. They wanted to make it as easy as possible. Stay away from other gods. Stay sexually pure. The third thing was eating meat from strangled animals. Now, here's something that was, they said it was taught in the synagogues for generations. And God told them not to consume the blood. These last two are really really connected. They're very close to each other. Because when you strangle an animal rather than you, you cut it you, you cut its throat and this sounds very sick, I know, and you were in church. But this is the way it is. I couldn't imagine being a priest back in those days, right? Because you'd be you'd just be a bloody mess all the time. Uh, they would you know how many animals they slaughter today. But when you when you you would you would bleed the animal out. You know how you, when you when you butcher an animal, you hang it, you let it hang for a few days. That gets all the blood out of it. And so when you strangle an animal, it doesn't the blood doesn't go anywhere. And they they enjoyed the other con, the other the other pagan countries around Israel. They enjoyed drinking the blood and they enjoyed uh, eating the blood. And God said the very life is in the blood. And so they would, what they would do is they would think, they thought if they drank the, the blood of a bull, they would get the strength of a bull. You see what I'm saying? They thought they took it and perverted it. Satan always perverts everything God creates. And so if, if he said the life was in it, they thought that they could obtain the life of that animal and they would have that strength, they would have that thing that if they, if they drank that blood and consumed it. But God didn't want them to have that. You see what I'm saying? So it was a specific law in Leviticus not to drink the blood. I don't think we'll have too many, too many people that, out of, the, out of the four, I don't think anybody will have too much problem with that one, right? Those two. At least I hope not. Well, you know, in some countries they do blood pudding. I, I couldn't imagine. <clears throat> What's that? Oh. <laughs> so... Um, Yes. I want to say this too. That those four things don't replace the Ten Commandments. Okay? The Ten Commandments still still stand. They were given forever. And if you want, you can boil the Ten Commandments down to two like Jesus did. And so, but, but it still does not override. These are just... These are to replace the 613 regulations that the Pharisees come up with out of the Ten Commandments. Do you see that? That's good, isn't it? Aren't you thankful for that? Okay. Verse 22. Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. 
The men, choose, cho- the men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also known as Barabbas, and Silas. This is the first time Silas is mentioned. Paul and Silas would eventually hook up and, and become missionary partners. Um, this is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and the elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia. Greetings. We understand that some men are here from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided having to complete having come to a complete agreement to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for this name of the, for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Isn't that good? You got to pause there. You got to stop and say, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. He makes the difference in our life. He really does. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Holy Spirit's always first to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols and consuming blood or meat strangled to animals and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. How about that? That's something, isn't it? The messengers went at once to Antioch and they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging them and strengthening their faith. They stayed with them for a while. Then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. And after some time, Paul and and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we had previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take John Mark, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Paphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him with the Lord's gracious gracious care. Entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. Disagreements. This whole chapter, a lot of times, has been about disagreements, and but and also putting less regulations on us. Isn't it good? Great men of God. You know, Paul and Barnabas were both great men of God. I'll say it again. They were both great. Barnabas, if you've got a nickname, son of encouragement, you're a pretty good guy. I mean. I, w- I would like to hang out with him. I don't know about you, but that's I like I like encouraging people, don't you? And so, um, but they Paul was strong. He was strong opinionated, and he thought that John Mark had deserted them, and so he said, I, "I." But you know, God has a plan. I want you to see this. Sometimes it's God's will that we part. I truly believe that, that Barnabas had a work to do and that him and John Mark could go do more if they were separated. And I believe that Paul needed Silas. I think Silas was the one. Remember when they were in jail, they're going to be in jail together later on. They're going to break out because they started singing and worshiping. And so maybe, maybe Silas was the kind of guy that would love to worship. And he knew that he, he was the kind of guy that could speak to Paul. And maybe he could... He could talk to him in a way that even Barnabas couldn't get through to him. Because everybody needs somebody. Amen? And, and 
ministry's messy, like I said. And then John Mark, um, later on, you'll see that John Mark, I think it's in Galatians that, that Paul says, send us John Mark, for now he's profitable for the ministry. So maybe John Mark needed some time with Barnabas to grow his character. Like I said, I don't, I don't think that Paul would have, would have uh, gelled with the disciples. I really believe there's a reason why God, why Jesus appeared to Paul separately outside of the 12 disciples because I don't think they could have handled him and he couldn't handle them. I mean, him and Peter, they, they counted the days they were together. 15 days, 5 hours and 6 minutes. No, they didn't do that part, but that's a preacher's exaggeration there. But they did count 15 days. So what I'm saying is Paul was a great man. Barnabas was a great man. God had to work for both of them. And sometimes when, when, you, when you get in conflict or, uh, conflict or a disagreement with another believer, just understand this. Don't, don't hold hard feelings against them. I don't think Paul and Barnabas left with hard feelings against each other. I don't think they did. But, that, but they, couldn't, they couldn't agree on it, how to do ministry. They, dis, they did, disagreed on Mark. And you've got to think, Mark wrote one, of the, one, wrote, wrote one of the Bibles, one of the books in the Bible. So he really probably matured greatly. Um, so in today's world, the ideology sometimes is if you, degree, if you disagree with me, now you're my enemy. And we don't need that, especially in the church. And I see that sometimes it's, it's worse in the church than it is in the world. And, and you're my brothers and sisters. And the one sitting beside you is a brother and sister. And you're going to, everybody disagrees. I, I heard it said this way, um, um, if you find two people that think exactly the same, one of them's not thinking. <laughs> right? So you're going to disagree. But know this, that God is still God and he loves both of you. I've got four kids and not all the time when growing up did they agree with each other. Trust me. When Austin's pushing Kathleen off the roof onto the trampoline, that was a disagreement there. So there was lots of disagreements with amongst our kids, but at the end of the day, they still they knew that they were our children and they loved each other, and that's the way we've got to be. I've always I've also heard this too: wherever there's a will, there's a won't, right? And so, but we've got to get to the place where it's okay to disagree as long as we agree on the majors. Amen. I look at this church and it amazes me because we have <laughs> we have Pentecostal, we've had we have Baptists, we have Lutheran, we have Presbyterian, we have Methodist, we have former Catholic. We've got everything that you can imagine in this place, but we still love each other. And it's because of Jesus. In the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad by the Holy Spirit that's in our hearts. And so the, he, he's the only one that can do it. Because I've been in just some single denomination churches where it's all that they have and they still fight. I used to tell this to my mom because I was raised Pentecostal. And I'd go and play basketball with the Baptists because they had a nice gym. And so I would come home and I'd say, why can't why can't the Pentecostals get along like the Baptists do? And because the, the Pentecostals, we, we would fuss and fight a little bit. I, but but the, you couldn't deny that the Holy Spirit was there. Is the, you, could, you would feel the power of God. But they were busy fighting amongst themselves. But the Baptists were out there winning souls like crazy. And, they, and, and so I said, why can't we just, why can't they merge together and just love each other and and, and so it can happen through Jesus. Amen? Through Jesus, he, he's the one that makes the difference. If you lift Jesus up, if you forget all the other 613 regulations, 
and you lift up Jesus, he pulls all things together. He does. I see it over and over again, and I love that part, don't you? The unity and the harmony that can happen. When we put aside our agenda, I heard, uh, I'm listening to a book by Tommy Barnett. Um, and he was in California, and he started a dream center. And it was for drugs and rehabilitation in L.A. And he, had, he has 400 beds for um, um, people that are rescued him out of sex trafficking. Um, he has, it was just a huge facility. They bought a hospital. But the church was growing. It was up to seven or 800 people. And there was a, a church down the street called Angelus, Angelus uh, Chapel. It was a four-square uh, Pentecostal church. And I never, and this was, I just heard this before, and so the Lord brought it back to remembrance as I'm talking about. The, the church that they had was outgrowing themselves, but this great big church had thousands, room for thousands, and it had split. It had a disagreement. They split, and they were down to 25 believers in that huge church. And so Tommy Barnett heard about it, and they, they couldn't fit anybody where they were at. So they went down the street, and he called a meeting with the Four Square Gospel businessmen. And he said, look, we believe in the same Jesus. You have the building. Well, I'm not asking you to give us the building. Matt will even get, he said, our, our doctrines are almost identical. He said, Matt, my son will even get ordained. He said, we'll leave the church in your name. You can have the proceeds from that, but we just need a place to worship with these people. And they did it. And it's the largest four-square church in their denomination. But Tommy Barnett was Assemblies of God. Isn't that awesome? And he said, if, if the world, it would be the greatest testimony to the world when they see two denominations come together and work for the glory of God, put aside their differences. And I tell you what, that's the way it is, and even in our town. We need to be praying for the Baptists down the street. We need to be praying for the Presbyterian churches. We need to be pray we really need to be praying for the United Methodist churches right now because they are having a great battle in this area. Many of them are wanting to take the, to have their churches. They want to pull out of that denomination, but they're having to pay for their buildings. Can't afford it. We need to pray for them. We need to lift them up. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all on the same team. If we believe Jesus Christ, him, him crucified, risen and come again, we're all on the same team. It's like we're the branch of the army, but some of them's Air Force, some of them's Army, some of them's, uh, you know, Green Berets, whatever you want to call them. I don't know. If you got four of them and they're special ops, I don't know. They, they might look at themselves that way, right? But we're still for, for all on one army and the army of the Lord. So let's pray for them. Bible says, if my people, he didn't say if my denomination. It's good. It's good. Welcome to Crossroads Cowboy Church Online. If you're watching this for the first time or maybe you've been watching for a while and you felt the Holy Spirit during the message this morning stir your heart and you want to give your life to Christ, you want to surrender your life to Jesus, maybe he's been dealing with you for a while or maybe it's just right now you have just felt his, his presence drawing you. It's as easy as this. You just, you, just, you just say, Lord, I'm sorry of my sins. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I surrender my life to you. I want to become a new person. I don't want to be the person I am right now. I want to become uh, a child of God. I want to, to do my, live my life for you. I, I, I can't, I've tried doing it on my own, and I can't do it anymore. And it's as simple, really as simple as that. I've heard people giving their heart to the Lord in all kinds of places. You don't have to be in the church. You can find Jesus because Jesus is right there with you. All you have to do is call out to him. Just say that prayer. Say, Lord, forgive me. I believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Come into my heart. Change my life. Change my direction. And if you've done that this morning or whenever, you, whenever you're watching this, it doesn't have to be, it can be anytime, anywhere. And if you've done that, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I, I just, I'm so excited for you. 
And I know that God has a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good, not of evil, and to prosper you. And if you give your heart to Christ and you surrender it, he's got a new plan. He's got, from, from this day, from this day, you're forgiven and moving on. Welcome to the family. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Give God praise right now. That's what you can do right there in your home. And if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you did that, write down below, uh, write in the comments, let us know, and we can be praying for you. Write your name in there and say, hey, I've given my heart to Christ. And we'll, we'll be praying for you here at Crossroads. Our goal here at Crossroads is to make Jesus famous. Not to, not to make our church famous, but to make Jesus famous. And so if you, if you want to help us spread the gospel and to reach other people and to change other lives, it's as easy as this. You can like and subscribe our channel, and you can share it with somebody. It's sharing the gospel wherever you go. God bless you. Thank you for watching again, and uh, hope you tune in again. God bless. Thank you.